My name is Trip Gorman, and in this episode of Sumia VC, I sat down with Matthew Meehan, co-founder and CEO of Mexico City-based Contempo, a buy now pay later solution for B2B in Latin America. He previously founded Centeo, a tech-driven lender in Mexico, and Divdendo, a VC-backed automated investment advisor focused on the Latin American market. He's also worked for a number of banks in Latin American finance roles, including Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Clove Point, Nomura, as well as a European-focused role at Morgan Stanley. In this episode, we discussed Matthew's thoughts on private equity and emerging markets, what it's like being a founder in Mexico City, why Matthew joined the Latitude Fellowship Program, and the importance of getting startups to market quickly. We discussed all this and more in this episode of Samia VC. Okay, Matthew, could you start by telling the audience a bit more about your work history up to and including founding Contempo? Sure. Um, th thanks for having me on, Trip. This is this is exciting to have this conversation. Um, so I, I'm American, uh, born in New York, raised in Ohio, uh, but I've spent almost all of my career working in Latin America, uh, sometimes based in the U.S., sometimes based in in different countries in Latin America. Um, so right, right out of college, uh, I studied uh, in, in New England, uh, I moved to New York, and I, I went into banking. Uh, I studied economics, always liked numbers, markets, um, and wanted to live in New York City. That was, that was kind of probably a, a big thing on my mind at that point. I wanted to be in a big city, uh, having studied in a small town and, and grown up in a, a not so big town in Ohio. Uh, so I moved to New York. I went to work for Morgan Stanley uh, in the investment banking division. Um, really enjoyed it. It was, I think, it was one of those experiences that uh, you know you you work a lot and uh, don't sleep so much uh, for for a few years, but definitely worth it because of how much you learn and how much exposure you get. Um, and I think you know, finally, I I remember thinking back after finishing an analyst program. I thought I'll never work in a bank again. This is, you know, this is interesting, but the lifestyle maybe is not for me. Um, and and you know, I say funny because I ended up working for a number of banks after that. But it, so after after doing an, an analyst program, um, I always had in my mind. Uh, I tell this as part of my transition of a career focusing in Latin America. That so my my grandparents on my mother's side uh, were from Mexico. Um, so my mom grew up in the States. Um, we spoke English at home, but uh, my grandparents uh, spoke Spanish with my mom. So one thing growing up uh, I found really frustrating is that my grandmother was really funny and told great jokes, but always in Spanish. Um, and so I never understood the jokes and people would tell me, well, it's hard to translate. So I would just kind of sit in the corner and not get the jokes. Uh, and so I always had in my mind uh, that I wanted to someday, you know, I had studied it in high school, but really didn't speak it, that I wanted to perfect my Spanish and, and finally get the family jokes. So uh, af after working in, in banking, I, I was probably a little bit burnt out and wanted to do something different. I went I moved to Spain, I did an intensive course, just spoke Spanish for, for several months. Um, and when I went back to New York, uh, I met some people that were running um, an investment fund uh, that had an office in Buenos Aires and projects all over Latin America. Um, and this was a, a UN backed and Rockefeller foundation backed sort of, uh, non nonprofit group, uh, but focused on private equity for emerging markets. Um, I got a job offer from them and it was, for me, it was super exciting to kind of finally combine this interest in finance and my desire to kind of travel in Latin America, uh, learn more Spanish. Um, so that, that was, um, that was my second job, uh, out, out of college. I knew I wanted to do a master's at some point, but this was kind of a, a neat, uh, sort of transition before doing, before doing an MBA. So I, I spent a couple of years working, uh, in, uh, in private equity across Latin America, spent long periods of time in, in Peru and Argentina, uh, and, you know, found, found just, you know, so so interesting to see how how capital was being flowing into countries that needed it um, and sponsoring projects that were going to create jobs and um, and really you know you, you see the impact of how private equity in, in emerging markets can be a, a big trigger for for growth uh, we can get into that more but that that was a, an amazing experience I did end up doing a master's after that uh, I went to Columbia uh, for business school in in New York City um, 
and you know, going back to my my comment, I, I'd never work at a bank again. As as I was finishing, the banks all come to recruit uh, at Columbia, and I met some people from Lehman Brothers, uh, which I thought at that time, you know, bank that's been around for 150 years, what could go wrong? This is an amazing opportunity. Uh, so so after graduate, I joined Lehman, uh, which had an amazing trading uh, trading program and ro rotation for for associates. Um, and I joined the Latin American uh, local markets group. So we traded um, different from what, you know, you, at that time, the emerging markets group for Latin America at most banks was focused on what we called external markets or sovereign debt or dollar de denominated debt. Uh, and there was a, a new group, um, not so new, but a, a group that had a business in Brazil and in Mexico to trade local markets. Um, the person that hired me for that um, was interested in my background, having worked in the region and said, um, this is cool if you could help us expand, if you, can, if you can build out or find a way for us to trade markets in Chile, Peru, Argentina, some of the markets they weren't involved in, then it's kind of, it's your business to grow. So that was a, a really exciting challenge, uh, amazing learning experience. I did end up setting up a business for Lehman Brothers in Colombia and then in Chile. Um, and then it was, it was my market. Uh, so, you know, fresh out of a graduate program that was a, a, a huge sort of opportunity for me. Um, and, and from that point on, I'll, I'll skip ahead, but I, I did virtually the same thing for, for almost 10 years at uh, both on the buy side and sell side. So sell side being global investment banks, buy side, uh, I worked with a, a couple of hedge funds, um, but I was always doing the same thing, which was trading and investing in markets, uh, particularly Chile, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, what we call the Andean markets. And then I did get into you know, Mexico and Brazil eventually as well. Um, that was something I, I really loved. It was, it's, it's exciting to, you know, the markets that are very illiquid and volatile are harder to trade. Um, and in some sense, you had to have more information uh, than, you know, more, more liquid markets are kind of, you know, trading the price action and a lot of the the relevant data is so easy to, to, um, to get, you know, everybody has the same information. Whereas in less liquid markets, uh, like, you know, Chilean inflation markets, which I traded, um, you know, you had to dig. So that, that was something I, I really like. you know, I, I would travel a lot to the region, try to get an edge as far as kind of what's going on uh, on the ground and incorporate that into my uh, sort of investment decisions. Uh, so I love doing that. It, starting in 2015, 16, I also got very interested about how technology was changing the industry. Um, you know, first kind of in electronic trading and algorithmically driven trading strategies, and then more broadly on like risk systems and just what kind of technology banks were using. Um, and it was actually quite, I always tell a story that when, you know, when I went from a bank to work at a hedge fund, um, you know, bank had thousands and thousands of employees, massive IT department systems they developed in house. And I remember one of the first days I was at this, this hedge fund, uh, I was booking my first trade. This was the, the kind of the risk management system. And I put in the details of my swap trade. And then I saw all of the kind of uh, sort of uh, statistics, uh, portfolio statistics and risk statistics beautifully displayed on my screen. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, where did you all buy this system? And they said, no, we built it in house. Um, and this was a, you know, 10 person hedge fund. And that was kind of interesting for me because I realized, wow, you know, that this is a perfect example of the, the problem of legacy systems at big banks. They use the same system forever because it's an integral part of the business. Whereas a smaller firm can just develop um, more useful, agile, more modern technology, and it works and it works a lot better. Uh, so I was fascinated by that um, and started thinking more and more about this. And, th and the other thing I noticed was uh, that at this time, 2015, 16, there was a lot of the, the big banks that I worked for globally were investing in technology. They were, some of them had incubators for startups. Some of them were investing in fintech companies. Um, I think both Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan had made these big fintech investments during that time. Um, but the Latin American banks that I worked with a lot were not making those investments. Um, and I was not seeing a ton of sort of native born fintech ventures. There were starting to be some in Mexico and other parts of the region, but 
um, but not so much compared to, to other markets. So that got me thinking like, wow, it'd be amazing to maybe, maybe I could invest in fintech companies until I realized you know, I, didn't, I didn't know much about investing in, in venture capital. And also if there, there isn't a lot of deal flow, what would I invest in? So uh, that was what brought me to this idea of, okay, well, maybe we should build something and launch something. And that, and that brought me to my first startup, which we launched um, at the beginning of 2016 with some partners. Uh, I can tell you more about that, but uh, just to fast forward, I'm now on my third startup. Um, each one is an adventure, a learning experience. Um, and it is true that you get better uh, as with most things, the more you do it. Uh, so I think that's a real advantage for, you know, and sort of encouragement for people that, you know, it is really hard to do a startup. Many of them fail, but if you love doing it um, and you find a way you know, do, trying again is, is, is definitely, I highly recommend it because you do get better and, and you have, you increase your chance of success. Okay. So could you tell the audience a bit more about buy now, pay later and the whole market in Latin America and Mexico and how does Contempo fit in that market? Yeah. Um, so, so buy now, pay later. Most people think of, um, you know, these, these big companies that have gotten a lot of traction over the last few years, like Klarna, Firm, Afterpay. Um, which the main solution they have is uh, for the B2C space. So this is a consumer that's buying a product. Many times it's online um, and they're offered a way to check out in pay and installments. Um, so I think that the pitch there is, uh, is really, really interesting. I think it's compelling that, you know, a credit card is kind of like a blunt instrument that just rolls you into this endless cycle of debt. And buy now, pay later is kind of like a programmed uh, sort of a plan for how you're going to pay something off, you know, if you're buying bicycle or some new tennis shoes. Uh, so I think it, it, it solves a really interesting uh, consumer problem. It's gotten a lot of uh, demand and traction. Um, but so there's a whole other segment. And this brings me to Contempo that is, you know, not for consumers, buy now, pay later for, for businesses. Um, so we call that the B2B segment. And that's where Contempo's focus is. Uh, it's a, you know, the product is similar in that you're, you're giving a buyer the opportunity to pay over time, right? And in installments. Um, but that, that user is very different. It's not um, an impulse buy or a bike that I want to pay and install. It's usually, it's a professional making that purchase decision. Um, and it's a planned purchase. It's budgeted. Uh, and they're usually recurring uh, stuff. So, you know, I'm buying supplies for my construction business. Uh, I'm buying supplies for my restaurant. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is that different from the B2C space, in, in a sense, uh, this market or this type of solution has almost always existed. This is, this is kind of how business is done between two companies. Uh, it can be called trade credit or net terms, but from, from, from many, many, probably hundreds of years, it's a, it's a very standard way for a big supplier to sell to another company is, hey, I'll get you, here are your goods and you'll pay me in 15 days or 30 days, some sort of term. Um, the interesting thing and the opportunity that we identified is that uh, this is mostly done internally by the supplier. Um, so there, you might be a supplier of you know, auto parts or textiles or medical equipment. And you're kind of forced to be to be in the game. You're forced to run a finance business at the same time. So you'll have this internal operation to evaluate your customers and look at the risk and provide them credit at the point of sale. Um, that's great for for you know push you know closing a deal, giving liquidity to your customers. But it's not so ideal when you consider that these suppliers don't uh, they're not necessarily experts in risk. They're non financial companies. So. Uh, running a trade, a credit process for them is, is difficult. They end up taking a long time. It's tedious. It's expensive. They take losses. Um, and what, what we found is that, um, you know, kind of modernizing that trade credit, making it faster, better, uh, we can uh, get to a, a larger audience, um, solve that problem for these suppliers and, and reduce their costs, boost their sales. Um, and give them the opportunity to outsource a function that's not core to their business. So that's really what we're doing is modernizing trade finance, making it um, kind of seamless, integrated into whatever sales channel you have, whether you're online or offline. Um, and it's a very big market. It's much bigger than B2C, 
some estimates uh, show that you know, in, in most countries, it's probably four or five times the size of the consumer market. Um, and B2B payments itself is, is quite um, archaic in, in many sense. In, in Mexico, we think this market, just to give you an example, is, is you know, of a greater than trillion dollar economy, which uh, that's about the GDP of Mexico is probably 1.2 trillion. Uh, B2B is around $400 billion or more. Um, and much of that is done. Some of it's done on credit, credit some is not. Um, and most of these, if you look, look at the PIME space, which in, in Mexico, the, the SME market, uh, more than 80% of these buyers uh, cite lack of access to credit as kind of an impediment to growth. So we're solving uh, uh, what we think is a big problem in an exciting market and, uh, and, and just kind of a newer, uh, more modern way uh, to extend trade credit. So how did you go about raising money for Contempo and how did you go about it for your previous startups? And you can maybe discuss a little bit about that experiences that you mentioned brought you to a better place for your, your third venture in this answer. Uh, so we, we raised some, some uh, like a pre-seed round. Uh, we just started working on this uh, at the very end of last year, beginning of 2022. We raised uh, money from some, some angel investors, uh, people that were willing to take a bet on something uh, that was not yet developed. Uh, we had an idea. Uh, we had knowledge of the market. Um, and I think the key for raising money was that we were super focused on a specific problem. Um, and we had, we had worked in that area. We had expertise in credit. We had built uh, sort of systems for processing, uh, uh, processing credit and sort of automating financial services. Um, but you know, I, I, go, I, I think having a very strong sense of what is the problem we're solving, why it's an opportunity, um, and then kind of explaining why we're right, why we're the right team to kind of tackle this, why we had the right skill set, um, and kind of m maybe even most importantly that it's that it's a big market, especially if you're going to raise from uh, VCs, uh, you do need to show that you're you're solving something that could grow into a, a big company. So. We put a lot of emphasis on the size of the problem. Um, and that, that was really how we, we raised money. It, you know, in the first few months, we were super focused on let's get a product out. Let's get customers. Uh, that was something, a learning from my first startup. Um, you know, it's, it's very natural to kind of want to perfect your product and understand and analyze. But the most important thing is speed and, and, and getting out into the market because that's what really helps you learn. Uh, so I think we were quite good at that. Um, and we did start working even before we were ready, before the product was ready. Uh, but we had customers that were willing to, to, to try us out. Uh, and with that, you, do, you get a little bit of traction and your story gets more interesting. So it's more compelling when you go to a next set of investors and say, hey, we're, we're, we're seeing this. We want to build it. And by the way, we already have some customers and they're really excited and we have more customers looking for us. So that, that was that was the, the, the approach. Um, and it helped us raise, raise capital in the last few months. What is your read on the current tech scene in Mexico City? And what's it like living and working there while working in tech? Yeah, I mean, Mexico City is an amazing place to be right now. It's like a, a Mexico moment almost. Uh, I think part of that was the pandemic, uh, people looking for, uh, you know, a place to, place to hide out with, you know, there's a lot of you know interesting things that attract people to move to Mexico. So you have a very dynamic, vibrant international community here, and then you know particularly in tech, um, there's just there's just more capital. So uh, you know thinking back to my first startup um, in 2016, there weren't a lot of investors outside of Latin America that would invest in a, a LATAM focused uh, tech startup. And now you have a number of global investors, um, funds based in the U.S. or in Europe that are excited about the potential for the region. So I, th I think, you know, the combination of that, you know, kind of people from all over moving to Mexico City from different parts of Latin America uh, and then capital uh, from other parts of the world that is kind of bullish on, on opportunity here is making it, you know, an exciting place to be. You feel like you're at the center of opportunity for for tech in Latin. You discussed in your intro answer uh, about private equity and emerging markets. Could you discuss a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, historically, you know, 
LATAM in, in particular has a lot of volatility for a number of reasons, uh, you know, political, social, but on the, on the economic side, you know, commodities has always been such an important part of, uh, of, of economies, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and commodity prices are volatile. Um, and, and I think that just, that creates, uh, you know, volatility in currencies, volatility in investment returns, uh, and that's made it difficult for, for private, private capital for, for a long time. And then you have this political volatility layered in, uh, huge kind of uh, wealth inequalities that, that create instability as well. Um, but that, that being said, you know, and focusing on Mexico in, in particular, the, uh, there's a lot of benefits right now that was, so just looking at FDI or foreign direct investment in Latin America is, is growing quite a bit versus the last few years uh, in Mexico. I think the average has been 30, 35 billion. We've only, we've already done that much just in 2022, halfway through the year, there's been more than 30 billion invested in FDI. So I think there's a, a ton of private equity, venture capital, invest, investment interest. And uh, my sense, you know, having been in Latin America for a long time and working and seeing capital, there's always a, as I was talking about commodities, there's always kind of like a speculative nature to a lot of the flows. Private equity is usually a longer term bet. Um, and so is FDI. So to see a growth in FDI and, and not so much growth in kind of portfolio flows is uh, quite positive for the region. So I, I, I'm pretty optimistic. Um, you know, I'm realistic in the sense that I know there's, there's cycles to this, but uh, it seems like a, a good time to be uh, investing in Latin America. What brought you to become a Latitude Fellow and how was your experience in the program? I got to know the Latitude folks um, I, I think through friends and, and hearing about the fellowship program, I, I did, I met the founder a few years back uh, in, a, in a different uh, life as an investor. Uh, uh, that's, that's Brian who runs Latitude, amazing entrepreneur, amazing story. And I knew they were building this, this network of uh, entrepreneurs called Latitude. And when we started Contempo, there was, I think they were on their third or fourth cohort um, we were, somebody mentioned, oh, you should apply their accepting applications. We had met them uh, to pitch Contempo as an investment. They have, a, they also have a fund. Um, so we already had that conversation. Uh, and we were, we, we just, you know, one thing that's really important when you're doing a startup is to be connected to a community of other builders and other entrepreneurs. And I was new to Mexico at that time, you know, still relatively, I've only been here ju just less than two years. Um, but I, th I thought it was a great way to um, be part of a community, meet other people working on interesting problems, um, and potentially raise some money too. Um, and it ended up working out that way on, on all those fronts. We raised money from Latitude as a, as a pre-seed investor, um, and have an amazing fund, a great investment team. And then the program itself was just, you know, I think it's really important what they're doing because they're teaching sort of basic entrepreneurial, how to raise money, how to think about uh, and define the problem you're solving, how to build product, a great number of lecturers that come and participate. And then, the, you know, like I said, the community is amazing. Uh, we meet up in person here in Mexico. There's groups in Colombia and Brazil. Um, but it, it, for us, it was a great kind of thing to do early on and, and great way to get plugged into the ecosystem. I love it. Okay. So finally, I have to ask Peter Thiel's famous contrarian question but with uniquely Simia VC twist. What important truth about Mexico or Latin America do very few people agree with you on? You know, a lot, a lot of people think I kind of, kind of two things and they're related. You know, I was, I was, I was giving, I went to Columbia business school. I went back a few years ago to do a, a two day lecture uh, or course with, with a, a friend. We, 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 co-taught a course on um, VC and startups in Latin America. And we had a, a great, great audience of students. And we, uh, both my, myself and the other presenter, we were talking about Latin America, Latin America, the opportunity to invest in Latin America, building a startup in Latin America. And somebody raised their hand and said, you know, do you know Latin America is not one country? There's a whole bunch of, you know, there's Chile, there's, and they're all different. And, and, and I laughed because I said, yeah, of course I know that, um, you know, it, it's a really important point and you're right. Each place is different. Um, 
but for a number of reasons, we talk about Latin America as, as one region. There's so, you know, and I think it's really important to emphasize what's similar, um, especially from a business perspective, because that's, you know, global investors like to invest in blocks. They want, uh, they want scale. Um, and I think there's, there's a huge, huge advantage for uh, kind of this um, sort of for, for each country to kind of uh, develop trade uh, with, with other countries in the region and develop this kind of sort of block almost similar to like the Euro region. So, you know, you have a lot of like 100, 200 billion dollar economies in Latin America, but together it's $4 trillion um, where, you know, obviously you have Brazil with Portuguese, but a lot of that is, is Spanish speaking. There's a lot of cultural uh, similarities and a lot of businesses that operate regionally. So I, I you know, I, to answer your question, uh, I think a lot of people disagree, say like, oh, each country, you can't build something that works across the region. I agree, but I think it's worth making that effort because you're going to be able to build something much more impactful, much more scalable. Um, and it is possible if, if you're building, um, you know, product that of course you might have to localize it in different places. Uh, but I think it's, especially in this world of uh, where we're operating and, you know, a payment system, for example, it looks different in every country, but if I build a product that works operationally, I'm solving an important problem. Uh, I want to find a way to scale that outside of, even though Mexico is a big market, if I can scale it to another country. So I think that that's one thing. And then related to that is kind of this idea that to, to build an important country in Latin America, I think it has to be kind of locally based and lo have a local origin story uh, and, and the people based on the ground. Um, specific, uh, mostly because of what we were just talking about, like each place is different. You, you want to be close to regulators. You want to be close to um, the business ecosystem. Um, so, you know, I think Th there are ways to import businesses from other places. There are successful case studies, but you look at, you know, Nubank or Mercado Libre, these companies, they're born in Latin America, they're developed for their markets. Um, and I think the solution ends up much being much better when it's uh, sort of tailored for the market and has an origin story there. There we go. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the SME VC podcast today. I very much appreciate your time. Thank you, Trip. Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Samia VC. My name is Trip Gorman. Make sure to like and subscribe wherever you view this podcast. And also subscribe to our newsletter, DealFlow LA, which you can find at dealflow.la.